Good evening. I'm so glad to see everyone out this evening. And welcome to our men's mentoring workshop as part of our Men's Day 2023. Our theme is men, Christian men mentoring the next generation in faithful leadership through the power of Jesus Christ. We worked hard on this to be our theme, and we, in our theme, we wanted to focus on mentorship, Christian mentorship, training up new leaders to carry on. We are not promised another day. So there's got to be somebody to come along after us. So we need to train them to come along and carry on with the work after we are gone. So this is a dream that, that I, myself, and our co-chair, who I want to introduce to some and present to others, Brother Quavis Peach Park. If Quavis, stand up so the people can see you. Some people don't even, haven't seen you in a while. Let's, this is Brother Quavis Peacock, who has worked diligently with me on this program, and we are so glad to have him as a part of our community here at the St. Luke Church. So glad to see so many of you out here today. And so as we begin our service today, let me read for you our scripture. And our scripture comes from Acts, the second chapter, and let's begin at the 14th verse. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last day, God says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your son, young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn red blood, blood red. Before that great day and glorious day of the Lord arrives, arise, but everyone, amen, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the word of God for the people of God. Blessed be our God. Now let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we are so grateful for you. All the wonders that you've done all the great things that you've done in our lives, Lord God, for bringing us to this point, gathering us together in community so that we might be better stewards and better workmen in your kingdom building. Sanctify us, O oh Father, for we come as empty vessels before a full fountain cracked, somehow misshapen. But Lord, we're grateful that you can use even cracked vessels to do your work. How you use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And we thank you for the privilege. 
God, we ask that you would dwell in this place with us tonight so that what is being said and what is being felt and the information that is imparted comes directly from you so that we might be enlarged. Our territory might be enlarged and so that we might have more authority on this earth that you have given us. And so that the kingdom of God may be spread through us so that this church, this community can have an impact on the community that we live in. So that this church can make an impact on this community that it is in. We thank you for the opportunity. We ask you to bless our pastor in his absence. Bless him as he travels, Lord God, and bring him back safely. We pray for our speaker, Lord. Bless him with wisdom and knowledge. Give him the words to say. God bless his family and his new addition. Continue to keep them in your loving care. And God, as we continue our celebration of Men's Day, we ask that you would add a special blessing and an anointing on it, that it might prove to be something that will benefit us for years to come. And when we leave this place, we might say, did not our hearts burn? as he spoke to us along the way. These and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, without further ado, I will present to you our speaker for this event, Brother Darius Brown. Thank you so much, sir. Amen. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Um, thank you so much, uh, St. Luke, for having me. Um, when I got the call, I was super excited um, about being here, um, right here in East Waco, Texas. I live in East Waco, so I'm all about um, being here um, just to share and just to commune with you guys. And so I'm um, a good friend with um, your pastor and Quavis. And so I see some familiar faces. Um, I'm not going to be too long, but um, I do believe God is going to give us a word tonight. And like you said, um, even even me, giving me a word um, so that, that I can continue and I can go forward. Um, so, amen. Let us pray. Look, dear Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for this moment, God. And we ask again that you would just come and be in this place. God, I thank you that you are holy and you are upright and there's nothing wrong about you, God. I thank you that you are with us, God, in this in this time. So, God, as we open your word, God, would you just hide it in our hearts so we won't sin against you, God? We want to make an impact in this community. There are men in this community that are in need of mentorship and discipleship. So, God, we ask you just to send us a word that will be refreshing to us. And, God, I thank you that you only not send us the word, but God, give us the resources and the provision, God, that we need. God, send people, um, and it's their hearts, God, to do your work. In Jesus' name we pray. A pray. Amen. 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 Um, just a little bit about me before I get started. I grew up here in Waco, Texas, um, and my whole life, I went to Waco ISD my whole life, and um, my family moved here just right outside of Hillsboro, and... Um, I grew up in a single parent home, and as I um, we went to South Waco Elementary, kind of bounced around at a couple of elementary schools, um, low income home where my father was around. Uh, he was I knew my, who my dad was, but he was um, he lived out of town, and so um, I remember my mom struggling a lot, paying bills, struggling. Um, to make ends meet and working multiple jobs to um, make ends meet. And 
Growing up in Waco, I had a loving home, but also experienced a lot of trauma, not because of my own parents, but a lot of times I would get left at people's house and spill a lot, I experienced a lot of trauma and um, just a lot of generational curses in my family. Y'all stick with me. Just a lot of ge generational curses in my own family. Um, a lot of the men in my family were not good examples is what I'm trying to say. A lot of the men in my family were either going to jail or they were getting out of jail. A lot of the men in my family, can I be transparent tonight? It's only a couple. It's, 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 we family now. But a lot of the men in my family were making bad choices. My, the women were okay, but the men in my family, there was a generational curse and I didn't know it at the time. But a lot of the men in my family um, were up to no good and they were not good role models and so growing up i was in need of a mentor i was in need of discipleship and so um i remember that i didn't meet really good men until i went to church it was not until i went to church that i had good examples of what a man was and so um i, I remember that um it was the church that taught me the word. It was the church that really um, put before me good role, men role models. And so at that, that point, um, I started to get into youth church, youth ministry, and I, and, and I remember pastors and leaders laying hands on me and prophesying, and I remember uh, me learning to exercise my gifts in church. And so I grew up, and it was the church that really helped me Y'all won't, y'all, come on now. Y'all looking at me. I'm preaching already. I'm going somewhere already. <laughs> it was the church. And somebody tried to tell me last week that it was some politics that the politician that helped me come out where God brought me. But it was, and I was writing this. I said, God, it was you who made a way for me. It was only you. It wasn't how smart I was. It wasn't how, how, how good my mom and daddy dressed me. But it was the church that really pulled me out of that thing because there was a generational curse. My daddy was a pimp. Let me, can I just tell you, my, my uncles, they were murderers. I had a, another uncle get murdered on Waco Drive. The, but it was the church that really led me out of that thing. And so I want to just really share with y'all, like, how the church can really be a resource and really be a, um, a place for mentorship and discipleship and also how God really intended that. He really did intend that in his word, he, in his scripture. I, I've seen it over and over again where he used discipleship to pull people out. And so as I move forward, what is mentorship and discipleship? And I, I've learned and just did a little bit of studying is that mentorship is really at a trusted and experienced advisor that promotes Christ-like character. So that's what a disciple is just simply somebody who follows well. Ooh, that's good. A disciple is, in, in short term, a disciple is someone who follows well. A good mentor is a trusted and experienced advisor that promotes Christ-like character. So I'm not promoting you to look like me. I'm promoting you to look like him. So that's what a mentor is. And who, who do we mentor? The Bible says we go into all nations. Every nation, we mentor all. Every young man, boy, and girl, every everybody needs to be mentored. And when do we do it? I've learned just through myself, you need to do it every week. Every week we should be here. We should be being mentored and discipled. Or bi-weekly. But I need to I need to have a relationship with you, Drexel. I can't just not say you uh, you my mentor, you my disciple. I'm being discipled by by my brother such and such, but I ain't seen him in three months. You ain't been discipled by me then. Because I got to know you. I really got to have a relationship with you. So that's when we mentor. And then where do we mentor? We can mentor. Jesus mentor outside. We ain't got to have some. We ain't got to have a pretty place. We don't have to have everything red carpet. But we can mentor at the church. We can mentor at home. We can mentor in somewhere fancy on Zoom. Now, now, now we got technology now. I had some people say, can you disciple me? And they live three, four states away. And we made it happen because we were intentional. Amen? Man, and so how do we mentor? And this is, the, this, is the, this is where I really want to stick. How do we mentor? Because I've learned that the best way to mentor is by a personal invitation. 
that 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 was good, y'all. Y'all just looking at me, Quavis. But really, if I want to mentor you, then I really gotta go to you and say, because the word says in Mark first, in Mark one, in chapter sixteen, what did he what did he tell the disciples? Mark Mark chapter one. Let's jump into the word, cause y'all, I'm not just giving y'all head knowledge. I'm, it's in the word. What I'm when I'm speaking is in the word. So Mark chapter one, verse sixteen. Mark 1, 16. And I'm going to read it just for the sake of time. It says, passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. They were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. A personal invitation. And then he says, and immediately they dropped their nets and followed him. He gave them a personal invitation. I remember the best experience I had into mentorship is I had a group of pastor, a pastor come to me. And he didn't go to my church. He said, I don't want you to go to my church. I don't care where you go to church. I want you to be a part of my, I want to disciple you. I don't want nothing from you. But would you pray about being in the discipleship with me? For six months, I promise it, God going to change your life if you would just pray. And I was just like, well, God, he ain't going to say no. <laughs> and so I entered into this discipleship, and, and it was a friendship. And, and we were transparent with each other, and we loved each other, and he, we walked through the word together. And that was, I was just like, you just gave me a personal invitation. That's all he did. And that opened the door for more. Now, if somebody say no, you did your part. But how are we going to disciple people that we ain't never gave no invitation to? A personal invitation. Not saying, y'all come to church on Wednesday because you know we're having church. No. You go to them and say, I need you. God laid you on my heart. He called you out. I, I think God is going to do something. I really want. And, and, and you don't have to have a big group. It could be one on one on one or one on two or three or four men. But what would happen if we got serious about discipleship? Men and women and say, you know what? I'm going to hold you accountable because it's, I've learned throughout my years that it's accountability that brings forth righteousness. I, I learned over the years, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I've learned throughout the time is that is when I start letting people in my business, come on now, y'all don't want to say nothing. Y'all want to sit here and look at me. But I had to let people in my business. Quavers know. I let you know. And then, because the Bible says when you got sin, you confess it to one another. And that's how we do it. We do it in a real discipleship. We're not going to do that with nobody we don't know. I'm moving right along. And he says, in, 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 Matthew, in Matthew, Matthew 28, is 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 my greatest is my greatest passion y'all my greatest my greatest reason to get up and before you today Matthew 28 is when it's when Jesus he died and he rose again we just got over Easter and and the Bible said that the 12 disciples went to go see Jesus because they said he rose again let's go see this Jesus and the Bible said that some worshiped him and others doubted and, and, and Jesus told him, them, they, he spent a little time with them. He spent every, I tell you, this word is going over discipleship over and over and over. But he spent a little time in, 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 in Matthew chapter 28. And, we, and we're going to go to one more scripture and we're going to be done. Matthew chapter 28, verse 17. Verse 17. Matthew chapter 28, verse 17. And it says, And when they saw him, they worshiped him, and some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that's good. All authority, not some of it, all of it. Mm. And 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 20, teaching them to do all that I commanded you to do. 
and behold, I will be with you always. And that's the final mandate he said to the disciples, right? The final mandate, the last thing he told them, and then he ascended. So the thing is, we, we got to be serious about that one. Because he told us a lot of stuff, but he said, but what the final mandate of, 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 from, from Jesus was, he said, I, now I need you to go. Not sit. We good at sitting. We're going to be transparent. I'm really good. I love my bed, y'all. I am getting, I'm getting old. <laughs> I got a newborn baby at home, and I tell you, I, do, I got some projects coming up, and I got to call Quavis on them. But I hadn't got around to it. <laughs> And God is calling me to go. And I say, God, every year when it's time to play in a conference and I got to play in a youth service and I got to play, you know, I say, God, you know I got two babies. You know I don't have the money. And I give him every excuse. But God said, I called you to go. If you go, God will provide. I've seen him do it so many times. But you got to be willing to go. He said, I have called you to go and then make disciples baptizing them. He said, make them. Oh, that was a good word. Holy Spirit. You got to make them. They're not going to come clean. Pastor, brothers, deacons, they're not going to come clean. A lot of times we want to catch them already clean. And that's not, that ain't nothing but a transfer member from another church. But we got to go and make them. We got to really be willing to do the work because that's what he called us to do. God, when, on the final, when, when I meet Jesus, I'm accountable to that word. Come on, now I'm preaching good. He's not going to say how good of a police officer I was, how good of a teacher I was, how good. He's going to say, but did you go? And did you make all disciples? And did you baptize them? And did you teach them what I taught you? you did you teach them the word? I can close the Bible on that one. He said, go and make in, in, in all the nations, baptizing them, teaching them what I have obeyed. And remember I said, discipleship is basically teaching someone how to follow, how to obey. I would get down to people, get down to do ministry and, and, and one of the pastors say, we just want to help you obey. We ain't, we're not here to do much. We're just here to help you obey the word. We ain't trying to make you just like me. I ain't trying to make you a preacher. I ain't trying to, I just want to help you obey and I want to help you follow. And so, um, like I said, I, I have started multiple mentoring programs. Um, I started my first one in East Waco Projects. Um, we started off, and I just said, I just want, I asked my pastor for permission because I want to be submitted to my leader as well. I said, can I go to the projects and disciple people? He said, yeah, you go. And I said, I'm going to start off with 12 kids. And I said, I'm going to see what happens. And 12 turned into 20, into 30, into 40, into 50 kids. And all I did was bring a hot dog and bring some chips and say, and I ain't had no big budget. I didn't have no organization. I didn't have a whole lot. But I said, I just want to make disciples. I just want to. And sometimes what I've learned is when I've been into discipleship groups is, is sometimes I ain't got to teach you all the time. Sometimes I just, I just want to love you. We would get up. Our discipleship group that I, I, I was in. It started at 6 o'clock in the morning. It took every angel to get me out of that bed at 6. And they would, and I would get there and pass and say, I just want to tell y'all I love y'all this morning. And I say, I know this joker. And he told me to give me up here to me. I just want to tell y'all I love y'all. And he sent me home. It don't have to be a sermon every week. But just let people know you love them. He said, I will, you will know you my disciple by the way that you, by the way that you love. We got to love on people right. Because people know when you love them. And even my kids knew. My kids, a little success story is my kids say, Officer Brown, we don't really deal with the police like that, but we love you. And that broke me. Woo! They look beyond all of the barriers of my law enforcement background and say, we don't really mess with the police like that. And my daddy told me not to, but I love you. Because they knew that we cared for them. And they knew that we was coming and we was committed. Because you can't say, you can't commit to discipleship and then not show up. Because the people are dependent on you. And so you have to set the standard. And so um, <clears throat> moving right along, I started my, my most recent one. That one started before COVID. When COVID started, it wiped out my mentor program, unfortunately, completely out because of YMCA. So I, our group got so big, we left the projects and went to the YMCA. 
We had sponsors. We vanned them in. We had, uh, we took them on trips. We had projects for them. We had, we had it going on. And then COVID came, of course. And then I didn't want the kids to be getting around each other with COVID. And so, um, that one, that one did come to a halt. And then this last 2021, we had a consultant. I worked at Waco High as a police officer for five years, and we had a consultant come in town. He said, Darius, you know how to mentor. I said, but I mentor fourth to eighth grade. I don't mentor no high school kids, because by the time they get here, we in trouble. <laughs> you know, you got to start small, because you, I said, these, these people right here, they make me want to, you know, I, I be want to put them hands on, on one of y'all. I can't mentor y'all. And, and I made up every excuse. And my flesh, like I said, is no good thing. I make up every excuse. I got 101 excuses right now. But but I, 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 he told me, he said, Darius, you know how to mentor. You need to mentor at the high school. And I said, okay, if you told me to do it, God, if this is your will, let, make it happen. So we started a program. I started a program from scratch. I started writing stuff up and writing. And I said, God, we're going to do it. And we, we did it for gang intervention. And so we stopped a lot of gangs from happening. We would interview each gang member. And when we interview each gang member, we, um, I asked them, would you be willing to come to a mentor group? And I, I, I was the police officer and I was over gang intervention. I knew everybody who was in the fights. I knew how many pr problems they had. I knew every kid. And I went to them and pulled them out of class. And I said, I'm gonna interview you for a mentor program. It's called the Leadership Lunch. I made some up out top of my head. They said, oh, yeah. I said, now, if I was to invest in you for six weeks, would you be willing to come? And they was like, yeah. As much trouble as background. I'm police still. I said, would you be willing to come? They said, yeah, we, we'll come. I said, if I feed you every Tuesday and Thursday, would you be willing? Every one of them said, I want somebody to invest in me. And a lot of times, I would target the leaders of the group. Because if I can get the leader, I can get them all. Because they follow us. People want to follow. My wife interviewing for principal jobs right now. She said, I don't know if I want to follow them today. I said, you ain't got to follow them if you don't want to follow them. People want a good leader. And so I would, in, I would, I would, I would um, bring them together. And we would call it the leadership lunch. And they would come in. And I would come in. And I said, I want leaders. If you're not a leader, hit the door. I want you to come in, and then I would I would really pour into them. I pour them. I bring in speakers every Tuesday and Thursday because I usually mentor once a week. But we was in a we was in a situation where we were having twenty some fights a week in twenty twenty one, and I wanted that to stop. And so this downtown started doing statistics and started saying, when you start this group, they didn't give me much budget. They didn't. I was still doing casework and mentoring, so I had my job and doing. So I would run out of my mentor meeting, go break up something, and go do a report, and then come back to my mentor meeting. And I was a one-man show. But the downtown said, Darius, we noticed you doing something because the fights didn't cut into three or four fights a week. You was having 20, over 20 fights. So I, I said, well, I got the kids at lunch. Look, fights happen at lunch. I figured it out. If I can get them during lunch, they said, ooh, lunch quiet. I said, because I got them. And, and I couldn't, and, and did I change their whole life? And did I, was I able to, you know, get somebody to, you know, did I win them all? No, I ain't gonna lie to you and tell you I won them all. But I will tell you is, while they was at school, they was gonna be good. You know, and so a little bit of effort went a long way. And so um, I wanna, I wanna, uh, I'll close by saying, you know, we we have to realize that that this is the word of God, and we gotta we gotta trust the process of discipleship because discipleship ain't pretty. You don't get a lot. I ain't up here preaching because God said I can preach the house down. I really can. Y'all need to tell me. Can, can y'all ask Pastor? Can I come on a Sunday? I really can preach. But God said, <laughs> but God said I called you for the small group. I want you to I want you to pour into the two and the three because He said when two or three gather, I'm I'm in the midst. I want you to specialize in a small group. And he, he poured that. He said, don't you ever think that, uh, get excited about a crowd because I have a, anointed you for a small group. And so, um, Acts chapter 16, I love the, like I said, I love the, I love the, um, the model of discipleship over and over in scripture. And the last one we're going to look at is when Paul really finds Timothy 
and he starts to mentor him and starts to disciple him. And that discipleship relationship is a really one, one very unique and one of my favorites. And when Paul, um, Acts chapter uh, 16, verse 3, It's, it's really unique. Acts chapter 16, verse, uh, what did I say? Three, verse three. It says, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him. And because of the Jews were in those places, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went on their journey from city to city, they delivered the, they delivered them from the observance to decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the leaders who were in J J Jerusalem. I believe another text says that they they brought forth teachings. And then verse 5 says, so they went and strengthened churches. It says, it says so the churches were strengthened in faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And so I love that because what happens is Paul is introduced to Timothy and, and said that Paul wanted to take Timothy under his wing and talk about discipleship. And he says, and what the first thing he do, he said he took him and circumcised him, which means he took him and cut the unnecessary flesh. And that's what it takes. It takes for us to disciple, right? It takes us, it's a cutting because I'm telling you, Jesus rebuked, and, and I, I need somebody desperately to rebuke me every now and then. I need somebody to tell me, because I'm telling you, my, my, one of my pastors that disciple me right now, he said, man, you, you can't talk to your wife like that. You can't tell her that, Darius. I said, okay, you know what? <laughs> you know what? I needed that. I need somebody to correct me every now and then. And also, <clears throat> I need somebody to, to not only rebuke me, but also replenish me. Replenish me. Make sure, pull back into me. Like, I, I'm working. I'm I'm police officer, I'm a teacher, and helping the, my family and, and ministering, I need somebody to come and pull back into me. And that's what Jesus did. He broke bread with those around him. He said, this is my body. He broke bread with his disciples. Like, like I said, it's not all about teaching. But he also broke bread with his disciples and held them accountable. And so I want to leave you guys with that um, that it's good to be rebuked, and it's also good to be replenished. But we got to start by loving them first. We got to love them, and they got to know that we love them. You know what I'm saying? They, like I said, I have the most, the most offensive barrier wearing a gun and a badge. If I walk in a room, people just look at me like they don't even know me. They're like, who is this? Uh-uh. Oh, I got to go. But like I said, the East Waco, they know me now. And you ask Quavers. I ain't gonna lie to you. They know me now. They say that ain't that's Officer Brown, but that ain't he good. You know they gonna fight for me. I like I said, I bought a house right here on Hood Street, and they I ain't never had nothing, no no problem. Because me and my wife, we decided if we're gonna do this type of work, why are we gonna buy a house in Woodway? If we're gonna do the work that we're gonna do, and we serious about it, I said. We'll be out of order to buy a house somewhere else because that's discipleship. Discipleship, I said, I want kids to ride by my house and say, that man right there, he is living honorable. I want people to ride by my house and say, you know what? I don't know a lot of them, but I know one. And so a lot of times our kids are where they are because they lack exposure to those positive role models. So I want to encourage you to go out and make disciples. Brother Darius, uh, if you could come back up. Does anyone have any any uh, questions for Brother Darius? What he gave us was rich. Well, and I, I, I just, boy, I'm ready to talk. I want to ask some questions because he he opened some doors. And
Um, see, I I have always started with men just because that's what I feel called to. I came into girls even when I started. Excuse me, my my program in East Waco was called Becoming Better Boys, and so they say, "Girls, you ain't got nothing, to girls." And my wife started girls, so usually I'll I'll start the guys and let somebody else pick up girls because I know what I'm called to. I came into a girl. I can't tell you how to be a woman, you know. And so there were programs at the school far as girls, but then I took over boys. And then I started, I duplicated the same program at University High, and they had girls and boys. Thank you. I do, um, I'm also a full-time teacher, so I'm full-time police and teacher, and I, I do run into that. Um, don't ask how I do both of them jobs, and I, I can't tell you. <laughs> but um, I do think, like I said, loving them, I listen to my kids. We So I teach criminal justice at the high school, and w today we went over, like we'll go over something that happens on the internet, and we'll say, what do you feel about that? And I listen to them. And I and I in my mind I want to correct them I want to rebuke them real right real good, <laughs> but I let them talk and I let them I really just be patient with them. The Bible say love is patient, and so if we gonna love on people, we just gotta be real patient. Uh, I think our generation and most of the kids like we we watch the when the substitute falls the teach or the student and we say what do you feel about that? They say the teacher wrong the teacher should have never put their hands on a, on a student. I said okay you know I'm trying to listen. But also, I say, but here my perspective, too. And so a lot of times they will listen, but they just want to be heard. And so I let them hear me. I mean, I, I, let, I let them know that I care, let them know that I'm listening, and then I also give them some feedback. And they're like, okay, I'm going to let that sit on me because you're right, Officer Brown. We shouldn't really be cussing in class. I said, because it's not hurting me, but you're showing me what kind of household you live in. You're showing me how much you don't respect others and yourself. You don't, you don't hurt me by cussing. I've been called. I've been. I'm a police officer for ten years. So I've been called everything under the bus, un, uh, everything under the sun. So, but I said, but you, you showing me that you don't respect people, and that's. And I said, and I'm a. I teach career and technology program, so I'm helping you get in a job. So if you cussing in my class, that means that when you go to work, you're gonna be doing that, and I don't want you to get fired. And so then, then I ain't had no more cuss words out of, out of a lot of them, because I say. And I, don't, I can't tell them. I'm a minister, so I, I, I'm a licensed minister, so you can't, you can't cuss in my class. No, that ain't. But really having them something, telling them the why. I heard that this is a Generation X and then Generation Y. Tell them, this is why. And just taking the time and explaining it. And then they'll say, okay. I hope that helps. Right now, I work for Baylor PD. Um, I work for Baylor Police Department, and then I, I teach some classes at Waco High too. I I was at Waco ISD, so I was at Waco ISD for five years, and then the last year I just switched to Baylor. Um, I work for Baylor PD. Right now, thank God I'm on I'm on I'm on baby leave, so ooh, I ain't got to see them for a little bit. Any other questions? Good question. Hey man, I, I really, I really appreciate that. That was, that was really, I, I got what I needed tonight, hey man. <laughs> uh, that that was, I really, I really appreciate that. I think, like I said, I got a couple kids who would just say, you know, I just got out of juvenile. I, I came a part of, and I was a part of your group. They wrote me a letter and say, I used to get in trouble so much, but because of this group, I want to stay. And and the moment I, I, like I said, I left, and they said, Derek, when are we gonna do the groups again? When are we gonna now? Then, you know, when are we going to do those groups again? When, 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 and, and so they, they, there's a big hunger for it. Even parents, I get calls every day. When can you do the groups again? And, and it's coming back. Amen. Like, they're, the, the groups are coming back. We're going to, I'm, I'm believing before the end of the year, we're going to have a, have a place and we're going to have a location. We're going to, we're going to disciple kids. And um, I'm excited about it.
Thank you for that. Any other questions? Any other, any other comments, questions? Well, I really enjoy it. If there's nothing else, um, I really enjoy it this time. Like I said, anytime I can come back, let me know. Um, I live less than five minutes away. <laughs> and so um, I'm excited to, to do the work and just keep me in your prayers as I continue to do what God's called me to do. Brother Brown, don't sit down. Don't sit down. Here's the fact. This won't be your last time coming. We have enjoyed this. Haven't you enjoyed Brother Brown? Let's give him a round of applause. This has been a wonderful session. So glad you were able to come and be with us. And we would like to just honor you with a gift for your time and for your talent. Amen, amen. It's just like when you come to, to our house. First time you're a visitor, second time you're a member. So you, you feel at home here. We're thankful for everyone who has come here. And we just, this is men's day, but you know we can't do it without our ladies and women. We are so glad that you were here. Thank you for supporting us. We couldn't do it without you. Renee, you are awesome. There's no way we could do this without you. You are amazing. Thank you for everything. Now, if all lines are clear, we are preparing for this weekend. Our legacy breakfast will be Saturday at 10 o'clock in our fellowship unit. We are all, we are inviting you all to join us. Bring your $10. It will be continental breakfast. Uh, we're thinking that we almost got everything we needed as far as the breakfast. If you think of something that you, you feel like you might want to donate, talk to Brother Andrew Cottrell, who is over, that, over our food at the breakfast. But we think we almost got everything. But give him a call if you feel like you need to, you'd like to donate. But that would be a special service. Brother Ryan Reed will be our speaker. We've also got a special presentation that we don't want to give away, but we want you to uh, come so you can be a part of that. And then on Sunday, Sunday will be the culmination of our celebration. And we will have as our guest speaker, Brother Charles Reed. Charles Reed is Ryan's dad, and we will have a high time in the Lord, and we are expecting great things. Thank you, Brother Cuevas, again for your leadership. Thank you, the men, for helping us out, doing it. We couldn't do it by ourselves. Thank you, God, for the opportunity, and God bless our pastor for being so supportive in our efforts. Now, if all minds are clear, we will have our benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the precious Holy Spirit rest rule and abide with us now and forever. Let us all say together, Amen.